Good morning and good afternoon for others and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Pam Asadi and I'm a sales manager at Perfect in Canada. I would like to introduce today's presenter, Mr. Mike Siosis. He will be joining us um, and showing us on how to plan and manage an online condition monitoring project. Please note that a recorded version of this webinar will be made available to you all. If you have any questions during during the presentation, please type them in the question box in your control panel. Mike will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Mike. Thank you, Payam. Here you go, buddy. Good luck. All right, you should see my, my screen, correct? Yeah. yeah, perfect. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so today's webinar, this is uh, focused on online condition monitoring projects um, and I think this is a very interesting topic because of where the industry with um, IIoT is going um, a lot of the products on the market and also the functionalities available uh, and some of the experience uh, myself and my team have had is we've seen some trouble kind of getting these projects to start um, or if they're started maintaining them uh, or just just the struggles that come with working with these projects in their own uh, and so what I'm trying to do here is to kind of give some guidelines and some and some helpful tips uh, to anyone that is looking at doing one of these projects um, and to also kind of pay attention to how dynamic this industry is and how dynamic a lot of these tools are. So um, hopefully at the end of this webinar, you'll feel like you got a path, a strategy, some type of um, uh, tip or, or helpful hints that will kind of um, assist you and the team in doing your own project. And so I think one of the first things to kind of talk about is how did you get here in the first place? Um, it's not uncommon uh, that a lot of times these projects or this discussion about machine reliability happens very closely to a timing of a machine failure. And so you have some type of issue, something fails, something crashes. Um, it's very resource intensive, it's very painful. Uh, you then have to get the machine back up online and you're then looking at how to, how to not do that again. Um, there could be something maybe more on a corporate or business uh, business angle where uh, nothing has happened or something did, but now you're getting kind of um, pressure from, from management to go after reliability. And so that might get you to the same stage as well. Um, you might have inherited an existing project, so you might be new to a facility or a site. Uh, something was already happening and, uh, and it's hard to maybe figure out if what it is, is it working? Uh, the torch has been handed to you. You don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, and so we can talk about that as well. Uh, and then there are some that are just generally interested. Maybe uh, they're a contractor or a service company. Uh, and this has interest in maybe a future business proposition or uh, customers are asking and, and you want to have some answers. So some of the key factors here, just to get them straight out. Uh, on the table is that this is not an impossible task. Uh, is it difficult? Yes. Is there struggles? Yes. Uh, but there's a lot of things to pay attention to and, and a lot of experience out there as well. Um, it's very important to stay focused uh, and to probably stay simple at start. And so you want to make sure that you kind of understand uh, what the project is, is attempting to do. Are you going after critical machines? Are you going after simple machines? Uh, are you going after just one machine, something that's very um, unreliable and has, and has posed you problems? Uh, and so whatever it might be, uh, start small, start simple, uh, and stay focused uh, and, and, and keep that in mind. Uh, and then also follow like a methodical plan. And so we'll, we'll talk about something here uh, to kind of walk you through the steps of how to, um, how to kind of keep this organized. Uh, and then the other component to this is to maintain communication with the team. Uh, this includes any catches you get, so you find something before it fails. Uh, you also need to tell uh, everyone when you miss something or something gets missed or something does fail uh, so that you can kind of come back around and see why that happened. Uh, but what can also happen is that you need to let everyone know that maybe you're just at a neutral position, status quo. Everything is the way it is. Everything's normal. Uh, you don't want to be kind of um, working with these projects and, and be forgotten. And so it's very important to have some type of report or some type of dashboard, something that just keeps people uh, and the team knowing what's going on and that it's uh, and that there's actually a process in place and that if nothing's happening, that actually might be the whole point of it. Um, 
the other component of this is a lot of maintenance and reliability, uh, reliability regimes are kind of reactive or preventive. Uh, reactive in the sense that some, you wait for something to happen and then you fix it, uh, which is very time consuming and costly. Uh, or you're on a preventative cycle where you just you're replacing things or changing things, not because of their condition, but because of some timing that was developed. Uh, it might be because the timing is is positioned in such a way that uh, we change the filter before it gets too clogged, and that was determined over some time. Uh, or you might have uh, like an oil change regime that is just based on time only. Um, the idea with these projects is to kind of get out of that cycle. Uh, you want to be doing and making actions based on condition, uh, and you want to be measuring and collecting data that then helps you make a decision, not some type of um, uh, midnight phone call to bring the machine back online or, or some type of uh, change to the machine that's just based on timing. Uh, and the most important part, and uh, I've seen this with my team a lot, is with just documentation diagrams, maps, all of this is very helpful uh, and needs to be created to kind of have a successful project. Um, you need to have some way to pass on this knowledge as you bring other people onto the project. Uh, maybe as the project evolves and goes to a different site, uh, you need to have uh, some information that can be pushed over uh, to the other sites so that they have some place to start from. Uh, or if you have trouble, you need something to go back on so that you can um, pull in other people uh, to also help you troubleshoot or diagnose, but they're gonna need to look at some information and they're gonna need to have access to some diagrams and printouts so they can do the best job to get up to speed as fast as possible. Uh, and kind of up front, I think uh, with all this information, the maybe one of the most important things to take away from this presentation is that uh, if this is brand new, and this is uh, seems like a daunting over the uh, very, overly complex task, uh, you might wanna consider getting a consultant. And a consultant can help in, in many different ways here. This is a very dynamic industry. The technology is changing very, very quickly. There's new options uh, for different products uh, almost on a daily, if not a weekly basis. Um, you also wanna possibly have a consultant because they have a lot of experience from other projects. And the experience from other projects uh, might be completely related to what you're trying to do or completely unrelated. Um, but that experience might help you get through some IT hurdles, hardware hurdles, software hurdles, uh, just general data um, uh, analysis uh, complexities. But uh, the IT component might be one of the strongest things to take away because there's a growing need now with the interconnectedness uh, of sensors and softwares and different sites, uh, or even the, the uh, situation presented in with a lot of us working from home. Uh, this IT component is now growing stronger and stronger uh, and needs to be kind of felt, dealt with more importantly and earlier than maybe in some other projects. Uh, and then the consultant can also be like your project manager. Uh, so you might have someone that can be interfacing with all these different teams. Uh, you have this asset that you want to monitor, you want to check its health. Uh, it's not just engineering and maintenance, but you're going to need possibly help from IT to get the, the information to where it needs to go. Uh, and maybe even the OEM because you need to get some information about how the machine was constructed uh, so you can add in full frequencies and different things like that. Uh, and so one thing to to kind of keep in mind is uh, if this is if this is the first time taking on a project, um, consider reaching out for some assistance. Uh, and in this industry, there's quite a few people that have have this experience and would be uh, probably more than happy to help you out. And to reiterate again with the IT question. Uh, it's really critical to get uh, anyone from that department involved in the project as early as possible. Uh, there's some barriers to entry. It might be about security. It might be about uh, just where things are gonna be located in the plant, what type of networking is required, uh, whether there's any special needs on a server or virtual machines. Um, the, the best way to get all these questions answered is very early on, bringing in uh, IT later after certain standards have been established or certain hardware has been purchased could really cause a bottleneck, a, a real barrier. Uh, and so the key, the key here is to start early. And this is even more important now than before, uh, depending on where your data is going, whether it's staying on site or it's going to a cloud, um, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page about uh, all the information. And with these projects, uh, you should have a strategy in place. Uh, kind of an end goal. 
Uh, and so with these uh, online condition monitoring projects, you might be collecting vibration data uh, with the sole purpose of trying to maybe create work orders. Uh, or um, you don't need a work order, but you're looking at maybe something very specific, maybe one asset, uh, and you need data to so you can troubleshoot it because its performance is maybe not uh, where it should be. Um, you also need to kind of have a strategy on, are you going to record data on everything? Uh, is, the, is the real task to go after a lot of machines? Um, are they just going to be critical? Uh, I, would, I would definitely mention to focus on probably critical and keep the project small to start. Um, if they're critical, are they process related? Um, and whether that's important to, uh, to your strategy. Uh, and then how often you need data. And so something every minute or something every hour, every day, uh, it's also going to be important to figuring out what the end goal is. And so if you have something that's going to fail quickly, uh, data every hour or every day uh, may be not enough. And so you might need to measure something more often so that you can generate the work order soon enough so that you can come at, uh, come back and, and uh, uh, execute a maintenance uh, or a reliability fix uh, to get back online. And so the strategy we'll talk here as we continue. Uh, and then when working with these projects, uh, there is, of course, a learning curve and there's a lot of different um, information and uh, know-how and terminology. Uh, this is a place where it's like having a consultant uh, involved with the project can be very helpful because they, they can bridge this gap quickly uh, between uh, the consultant and the company looking at the project. Uh, but if you're going to take this on your own, it's good to kind of uh, get involved with with this. Um, there's a lot of these industrial protocols uh, that are that are used out there, um, like uh, with these the Modbus and the Profinet. Uh, it's important to know what those do, how you can leverage them, what type of data they move back and forth between the different pieces of equipment. Um, network and security understanding. This is definitely where the IT side of things comes into play again. Um, and, and also having constant contact with, with IT during your project can help uh, alleviate any issues here. Uh, but the hardware is also changing and, and there's a lot of new terms that are coming into the, um, into the environment now. I mean, there's the MEM sensors uh, are, are, are starting to take place uh, more, um, uh, more likely than some of the other technologies. Uh, there's even some sensors out there for force detection. Um, but then wireless communication is changing also rapidly as well. So we are, we're looking at Bluetooth 5 and then we're on the cusp here of 5G. Uh, and so these terms, um, they're going to be used often. They're going to be used um, between different, uh, they're going to have to be used across different disciplines. And so between maintenance, reliability, and IT, having an understanding of what these terms mean is going to be critical to kind of having the same, uh, the same plan for the project. And data management, um, this is going to be where the data that you're collecting and where it's going to go. Um, and it's important to, to realize that there's a lot of different systems uh, that the uh, that operators, reliability, management, they're all looking at different systems sometimes. And where the data goes is going to be important so that someone's acting on it or looking at it uh, or, or reacting to it uh, in a proper time frame. Uh, in some cases, this data goes to some vibration software. Uh, you might have some, some very um, precise signals uh, or time waveforms that need to be analyzed or post-processed. Uh, you need to know where that's going to be going and how it's going to be used. Uh, you might be sending it to a CMMS system, uh, so it's, it could be recorded and made and made into work orders or or alarms and different uh, barriers and thresholds are executed so that you can have automatic work orders uh, created. Or you might have like a SCADA or an HMI control system, something in front of an operator uh, that might be uh, posting live data that the operators can react to uh, and, and uh, either speed the machine up or slow it down or change process parameters uh, to, uh, to reflect the performance of the machine. And with these different options, there are some limitations. Uh, and so with, with vibration software, there's probably few issues sending and receiving all these complex uh, time waveforms and, and spectrums. Uh, but CMMS and different SCADA systems, you might have to uh, pay attention that some of these more complex graphs don't move or display properly uh, or transfer properly to these other systems. You might only be able to get whole numbers or, or just a number of the speed and, or maybe a number of the vibration, but not the graph. Um, there are, there's power to that to be able to send that type of data to those machines, but you need to also understand the limitations uh, and what that shows to the operator or to um, 
or to the person managing that system. Uh, and so looking at data management here, there's also a component to where is this data hosted locally? Is it in the cloud? Uh, and so to keep in mind that you might have uh, you might have some data leaving the site and what security it's under, uh, or it's staying on site and you have access to um, to that within the company network. So I kind of laid out here a strategic process, um, something that can be followed uh, in terms of how you kind of set up one of these projects and plans. Uh, the first decision that has to be made is just where you're going to take the measurement, what type of sensor you're going to use, where the measurement point is, what the asset is. Um, and once that's determined, uh, you then need to kind of figure out what's going to then collect that data. Uh, in this case, it might be a signal processing system or maybe a PLC. Uh, and so once you assemble those, you then need to uh, concern yourself with where the data that is being collected, where that goes and where that gets saved. Uh, and so a couple options here might be that you're sending the data to uh, an, an email, or sorry, you might be sending it to a, a system that can then generate emails and text messages uh, based on the uh, alarm values that are, or, or any type of value or threshold that gets, uh, that gets breached. Um, you might be sending it to a SCADA or an HMI system, uh, and that might be showing that to some operators. Uh, you might be sending it directly to some analysis software, um, so that you can take a look at uh, complex waveforms and do post-processing. Um, and then, or you might be sending it to a CMMS for, for your work orders uh, and, and uh, logging of, um, of asset criticality. Uh, from here though, and this, this would be your kind of basic system layout, um, how you handle what happens is the next important part. Uh, and so if across one of these platforms, you get like an alarm or a breach, um, what happens next? And so you might have uh, an, an email come into your system, you might have a work order generated. Uh, you should then take a look at this and say, all right, well, we have to analyze and see if this is real uh, and create a report uh, or analyze and determine maybe it's not real um, and figure out what the next thing, what the next step is. Uh, and from there, determine what the next, uh, what the next step is and that might be to either take action, uh, that you have uh, maybe nothing wrong, maybe it's a false positive. Uh, and so you have maybe a trend with just a spike that went up there and then it's uh, and then it came back down, something not to, to, uh, to act on just yet. Or you might have a problem and you might have to communicate this with the team. Uh, and so you might have to, to take a look at this asset more closely. Uh, you might have to deploy like a reliability uh, a strategy like doing alignment or uh, thermography or an oil sample or something. Uh, and so this would be uh, communicate with the team, determine how much time you have. Do you have enough time uh, with the process or with the asset? Uh, does it look like it can, it can run a little bit longer? And then that will define your actions, how fast you, you need to make uh, fixes or um, whether you need to actually plan something uh, more soon or you can wait a few months or uh, or plan it out for the next downtime. And one of the questions that we get uh, from time to time concerning sensors is this wireless versus wired uh, discussion. Um, there's quite a few options on the market. Um, I was gonna talk about a few of the pros and cons here. Uh, there's considerations to be made for both. Um, the, one of the top things to consider when looking at these type of sensors uh, is interference. Um, and with these with wireless sensors, depending on the wireless protocol it's using, whether it's uh, Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, um, you, need to, you need to kind of pay attention to where these sensors are installed. If they're talking to a gateway, whether there's a concrete wall or a metal frame in the way that's going to cause interference, uh, that needs to be considered. Um, but uh, with those with that in mind, it's not uh, only a Wi-Fi or a wireless issue problem. Um, if you're running a solid cable or, or a, a solid cable and sensor, um, it's possible also to have high voltage uh, interference depending on where you run the cable, uh, or also the presence of noise. Uh, something like a VFD or, or different types of machinery can produce uh, that can also affect the cable to connection. So interference is both, uh, both an issue for these two technologies. Uh, if you're looking at installation, uh, installation for uh, like a wireless sensor, 
Uh, typically, it's a little faster. Uh, your sensor is going to be either attached to the machine one of a few ways. You're going to uh, bolt it down or with a threaded uh, connection. You're going to glue it or maybe use a magnet. Um, and then you have to install maybe a gateway or a connection po uh, point somewhere. Um, and then that'll maintain the, uh, the connection to the system. Uh, so there might be a little bit of an easier process there, as long as you're taking into account how interference might play. Uh, but with the with the sensor, with the permanent cable and sensor, uh, maybe a little more upfront work, you're gonna have to find a place for the sensor to be attached. Uh, and it might require some of the same uh, uh, magnet or, or physical connections as the, as the wireless. Uh, but you're gonna have to take into account cable runs uh, and also where your data collector, uh, where your system that's collecting this data is gonna live as well. Uh, and so those, those considerations need to, be, need to be made up front uh, so that you're, you're minimizing your cable runs, maybe using multi-core cables, uh, maybe even junction boxes, uh, using, or, or if you have to put sensors uh, and cable and conduit, so also consider that as well. So there's some installation um, issues that need to be addressed. Uh, measurement range, and I mentioned measurement range uh, as in like the frequency range of these sensors. Uh, if you're looking at uh, a wide range of um, different options on the market, uh, on the wireless side, typically there's a measurement quality versus battery life issue. Uh, if you want some higher frequency data or you want higher quality uh, graphs and, and, um, and data sets, uh, there is sometimes a trade-off that in order to get that, you're going to lose battery life. Uh, that might be a consideration. Uh, that either deters or is not an issue for the project in itself. And so that's a determination to make uh, while, while looking at the asset that'll be measured. Um, for a like cabled sensor or a permanently mounted sensor, uh, there's a wide range of, they've been, these sensors have been on the market for, for many decades. So there's uh, a wide range of capabilities and price points, um, depending on uh, how much accuracy you need, what range you need, whether it has some, some dual features like maybe temperature or or ultrasound or something. And so those, those options are available. Um, but uh, there's also places where both, you might be able to find a sensor that needs both, where you have a, a cabled sensor and a wireless sensor that both the same range. Uh, and then you have to figure out if the cable or the battery is going to uh, work for your certain project. And power requirements. Uh, for a cabled sensor, you just need to make an initial connection to say main voltage or, or the main power source. Um, but with a wireless sensor, uh, as I mentioned on the previous point here, is that depending on what kind of uh, measurement quality you want, um, you're most likely dealing with a battery here, and you're going to need to have some, some type of replacement plan. And uh, these wireless companies uh, have kind of a, a time range where the sensor, given its certain measurement properties and how frequently it measures, should be able to give you a pretty decent idea of how long that sensor is going to last. Uh, and when the battery needs to be replaced, if it can be replaced. Uh, and so with these type of um, systems, it just needs to be put into the plan that if, uh, if you deploy uh, some wireless sensors, that there should be a plan in the future to, um, to handle their power requirements. And, on, and this, this is about the data. And uh, I, I think this is the, uh, one of the more important aspects of this presentation. Uh, is that there's a lot of systems out on the market that can collect uh, very complex, very intricate data uh, that does not make you the most successful all the time. Uh, and so having this, this very complex data set, set doesn't necessarily equal this success. And you really have to determine what is critical uh, and, and what is important to the machine uh, and need to know. And if you don't know, you need to test. Uh, and so in some cases, if you're, if you're brand new to, to collecting any data on this machine, uh, it's important to take a look at what, what, kind of, what type of data you can collect with your sensor uh, and to try to take as many different types of parameters as possible. And so if you can take overall data in both velocity and acceleration, uh, if you have access to say shock pulse or envelope readings, uh, this type of information, you should collect this so that you can correlate it and look for patterns. Um, the, the real power of an online system is that if you can take this high frequency acceleration data, this is really going to give you a key to like early bearing detection uh, or, or early failures. And so uh, this is this comes into play where um, depending on 
the type of system, the type, depending on the type of asset, like if you're if you're uh, uh, walking around the machine, you can hear it or, or feel an issue um, on the machine. That's really too late uh, of a time frame to to make any actions. Uh, by the time uh, your human senses can kind of perceive what's going on with the machine, if you can hear a problem, feel a problem, or feel temperature differences, or feel it shaking, uh, that's quite late. Uh, the, you're, you're probably running out of chances here to, to save the machine. You're probably more in a crisis management situation. And so the, the key to having an early kind of plan to get ahead of this is to, um, is to have access to some of this high frequency uh, data to give you a good trend. And so, for instance, here we have an example. Uh, there's a here's our PNF curve over here for how uh, machines tend to fail. Um, and for instance, here's some data on the bottom. This shows an acceleration graph where we have kind of an increase in the acceleration uh, that's causing um, causing the trend to increase. Uh, there's a little cursor here with the M. This is really a moment where the the uh, the user recognized that there was something wrong. They stopped. They investigated. Uh, then they proceeded to fire it up again, and this machine didn't last very long. It ended kind of over on the right-hand side where it failed. Uh, so they, they took a look, could not figure out what was going on, continued to run the machine, and then it went to failure. Uh, and so, but we, what was nice here is that this is not a complex data set. This is a simple trend, uh, and this simple trend gives you access to seeing a machine perform, perform uh, during its failure curve here, which is very unique and probably very helpful to figuring out how to uh, handle the machine. So, and so just some more helpful hints um, and in reference to what I was mentioning before about the human senses, they're a terribly lagging indicator of machine condition. And so uh, when you're looking at something, you really need to have a vibration sensor on there that's collecting some data that can supersede really hearing something or seeing something move to give you the best indication of when to, when to work on it. Um, you, but in order to kind of know maybe where to take the measurement or what to look at, uh, you can use some of that information uh, to kind of give you a starting point. So uh, it's not uncommon that, that uh, you might have experience like you're in, this, you're in a building with maybe an agitator and you know that during certain processes, the building starts to shake. Uh, and so that can give you an indication of maybe where in the building it's greatest to focus on taking data there. Um, that can helpful. That can be helpful, or to focus on maybe one particular machine that's causing the shake and and focus uh, on that particular machine as opposed to maybe another one. Um, the the other thing is that you might be hearing something, some type of like high pitched uh, uh, squeal or or frequency noise. Um, that can give you an indication to look at one machine over another, and that can be very helpful. Uh, you might feel something like you're walking by a machine. You can tell it's definitely vibrating more than another. That can be an indicator as well. Uh, these are just starting points, but at least you can then know where to put some sensors and collect data. Um, or it's pretty plain in that the machine maybe just trips. Uh, and, and that tripping machine is then a focus of, of, your, uh, of your project to figure out what's going on and why. Uh, and, if you're, and if you're lucky and you have maybe some diagnostics on that machine, you can take a look at current load and see if that increased uh, and, and take a look at some of the process parameters, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Um, and then there's a question here, depending on the asset, and this can be very particular, is that can you afford to let it fail again? And with the asset, if, it's, if you've already been in a, a cyclical uh, run it, replace it, run it, replace it type of situation, then you might be uh, in a position where you can then collect data and follow your, your kind of legacy plan, but then use that lifespan of that asset and when it, and, and it's kind of relatively predictable failure to build a data set that then helps you make better decisions about how long you can run. Um, this may not work all the time. If you have different assets or machines um, that, that experience this, what might happen is that you find uh, that it doesn't make sense to monitor this and it might just be easier to replace it and fix it as it goes. Uh, that's a decision that'll have to be made about the project. Um, but if it, but if you can afford to let it fail again and collect data for that cycle, that can give you some very interesting information that could be used for your project. Uh, on top of that uh, is this idea that there's other pieces of data being collected that can also help you 
with this um, with this project. We call them process parameters. Uh, and this is typically ancillary data. So it's other data that's being maybe collected by different sensors. It's present in the system. It's a statistic. It's It could be many different uh, components, but with this, it gives you the ability to have diversified data. And so you can then collect vibration and compare it to a couple different types of uh, different systems or different um, uh, uh, process parameters. And so one, one of which could be considered speed, but a lot of times speed is, is sometimes mandatory depending on the machine you're trying to measure. And so that might be uh, something you're already collecting. It's not an additional parameter. Uh, temperature might be another one. I have used caution here. Temperature is typically very lagging as well, is that by the time something gets hot, uh, it might be too late to really get ahead of its, um, to get ahead of its health. And so temperature might be helpful, but should be used in caution. Um, current and voltage, uh, a lot of the machines are driven by electric motors. So you might have access to this data already through a PLC or, or, or a SCADA system. Um, you might also have some information about an operating state, whether it's loaded or unloaded. Uh, and some things um, like an air compressor, where then it, it, it clicks on and off into different stages. Uh, this could be interesting for your vibration data. It also might be required uh, because in order to compare your data, you might need to know whether the machine was loaded or unloaded at that time to have a, to have a good um, comparison. Uh, pressure, fluid level, uh, process stage, valve position, these are all other things that can be helpful to understand that if you're seeing a phenomenon in your data, do any of these other parameters affect uh, the performance of that machine? Uh, and another could be, it's just like price. Uh, was the price of something that day affecting why the machine was running at a different rate? Uh, there could be some very abstract concepts here used to compare compare data to see if there's patterns um, and for this is where the power of, um, of connected reliability really comes into play is that there's a lot of other process parameters that are out there that may not uh, pose a, a, a um, an obvious correlation but are very helpful when compared together uh, and, and it might be very hard to figure out what that parameter is, but with this connected reliability and the ability to have data kind of processed by cloud systems and, and machine learning, uh, you might find patterns between two very dissimilar data sets that could be used to, uh, to your benefit. So I, I'm talking about the, uh, the importance of like very simple data. I can't avoid the fact that there's also complex data as well. Uh, complex data being like time waveforms and FFTs. Um, this can be very, this is very helpful in kind of getting from one um, strategy to the next. Uh, using simple data kind of gives you this early warning. It, it tells you maybe where to look uh, and, and which machines are going to be your bad actors and which ones require the most attention. So the first goal should be to kind of collect data and to, to, to uh, detect the behavior. Uh, and this should be then the first goal is to get out of this reactive and preventative cycle and get into something predictive where you understand the machine's condition and can make decisions about when to repair it and when to, uh, and when to help it with maintenance. Um, once that confidence in that, in that process has been built and you, you have a system and a project uh, that works effectively there, uh, the next step or the future goal should be to go one more uh, step further into like a precision or proactive maintenance. Um, this is more difficult. It takes more time. Uh, it requires looking at some of this complex data to see why the machine was failing in the first place, uh, or maybe why uh, a change to the engineering of the machine is required. Uh, this, this is sometimes um, people jump to this level without getting the first part uh, kind of situated, and you can get into the weeds really fast. And so you're working with this complex data. You might not know if you're looking at the right place or in the right machine, or you only have one data set uh, and you don't have a trend, you don't have a history. This can be really tricky. Uh, you might find some experts or professionals can jump to this uh, immediately uh, and look at this data and analyze it and, and make conclusions. Uh, but the real first goal should be to collect and trend the simple data so that you can look for the, um, for the most critical machines. And once you start to move then into this uh, more critical complex data, you might also be moving into other, other areas such as oil analysis and, and, uh, and, and checking into environmental hazards and different, 
different other components. And so this is where uh, you might need another team, maybe even maybe even taking additional measurements. Uh, it's just going to take more energy and more time to solve. And so that should be kind of known ahead of time. Uh, and just for just for the simplicity, and I couldn't get away from not putting some complex graphs in here. I mean, this spectrums and, and spectrum trends and time waveforms. This is what we're talking about with complex data. So I want to talk about some example projects. Um, and for instance, here we're talking. This is a wind turbine, uh, and the project. This is offshore wind, um, and the scope of the project was to um, have a have a 14 sensors and two tachometers. Uh, monitor the, the drive components of the turbine. Um, so it's not like this is a hundred sensors or a thousand sensors. This is uh, an, like one asset, 14 sensors, um, and, and the project is very well focused and very well defined. Um, but it's not without its challenges. This is remote access. We're talking about issues getting connectivity from time to time. Uh, also remote access in that if there's something wrong, uh, you need to have maybe someone go to the turbine that requires uh, another level of, um, of uh, hands-on experience that might be different than other locations. Uh, but these projects, if you look at it from a, from a simple point of view, um, it's really one asset and some sensors. Uh, and we'll take a look at some other applications here as well. This one's with a compressor, uh, an air compressor uh, that, we, uh, that was a case study done on. Um, it's, uh, a screw compressor and it operates in two different operating pressures uh, with this graph down here in the lower left. Uh, this is an example of having a process parameter correlated to your vibration data. Uh, and so the, the machine on the right here had um, uh, stage one and stage two. The X's mark where the sensors were installed and, and where, the, where the vibration data was being collected. Uh, and then the graph on the left, uh, this is a graph of uh, vibration based on what stage uh, loaded or unloaded uh, that the compressor was at. And so we have these like green areas where, which is showing us where the, the compressor vibration uh, was most uh, prevalent. And so you'll see in these two locations um, that when the machine is running in different, uh, in a loader or unloaded, that's where the majority of the uh, vibration level resides. Uh, you also see down the bottom left that if the machine's idle, that's where it lives there as well. So this data is very helpful because you can see that uh, where this, where the most of this data lives, and then any outliers from here should be very easy to detect. Uh, and so this is this is not a complex FFT or a complex time waveform. This is uh, just vibration data plotted against uh, a loaded condition. Uh, and then here's another uh, application. This one goes a little more in depth uh, about condensate pumps. Um, the issue here was that uh, uh, data wanted to be collected that wasn't on the route uh, program. Um, and the challenge with this was that it randomly cycled on and off. It was unknown when it was going to run, and how long it was going to run for. Uh, and so it was really hard to be there at the right time. Um, and there was two of these units. Um, the runtime of this was based on the level inside the tank, and so the float going up and down determined when the machine went up, uh, when the machine ran. Um, we determined, uh, with looking at this graph up here, that um, the machine ran for about 13 minutes every every um, every time the float was activated. Uh, so this was an interesting piece of data to have uh, that was not known before. Um, and then using this information. Um, the system was then programmed to react when, when the machine started to vibrate, it would collect data. And so that was a, a way of creating uh, a simple setup. Uh, and so if we look at our flow chart here, this was um, with the challenge of these two pumps and not knowing when they ran, um, we had to determine some where the sensors would be located and what system would then be processing this information. The next step was uh, then looking at these trends and setting some alarms. Uh, and fortunately, in this in this circumstance, we have a very uh, unique uh, graph here with these very defined values and a very clean correlation. Um, there was a breach of the of this vibration level. It went right through the warning. There was an earlier breach as well. It was a false alarm. Um, that did not lend uh, itself to anything, so that so the machine was uh, allowed to carry on. Uh, in this case, though, this breach was sent by an email, 
Um, and so that was, that was the indication uh, to the operators to take a look. Um, and then a report was made and uh, analysis was done to determine, is this real or is this uh, another false alarm? Uh, and so looking at the complex data, uh, we, this was then taken into account, looked at, and then found that some frequency markers and some machine behavior might, have, might indicate an early bearing failure. Uh, and so following our, our kind of uh, system over here, um, the analysis and report was, was used to determine if this was a, a real issue or not. Uh, in this case, uh, it required to take some action. So the team was communicated, uh, they defined uh, what they wanted to do. Uh, in this case, the answer was simple. It was to uh, essentially take the one pump, uh, lower its operating time, uh, and allow the second pump to then take over uh, so that downtime could be um, uh, planned in the future. Uh, and so with this strategy, this moved uh, these assets into a, a proactive uh, type of um, reliability strategy. Uh, and so this then makes it easy to source parts. The downtime is going to be planned. There's no effect on the operation. The second pump is taking over. Uh, and now there's data for the second pump to be used as comparison or even for other equipment. So this is very interesting uh, to have then because there's a kind of a, uh, from the beginning to its, to its initial um, issue, there's a nice clean data set as a, as a form of comparison. So this kind of closes up the idea of how to kind of take these projects, use some of the simple data, use some of the complex data, uh, and use it to uh, move out of that reactive and preventive uh, reliability strategy and break that cycle uh, and, and use this data to then get per, uh, predictive and then precise and proactive. So I am, I'm gonna leave this here and see if we have any questions. Um, maybe you can take over. Yeah, Doug, uh... Do you have the questions ready to go? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, I've got one big one for uh, for Mike. Um, uh, when your situation where uh, you track, you know, you're tracking everything, you're doing all all the right things, or does it seem like uh, you know you have a good program in place? How do you how do you eliminate like uh, operator error problems and other failures due to those operator actions. I mean, and, uh, you know, is that something that you would present to like, uh, uh, managers, uh, you know, uh, maintenance managers or engineers, like how, how do you suggest we could get some control over, over those problems? I can, yeah. And that's a good question. Um, and it's a, it's a connection to, um, this is like an outside effect, uh, and so it, you can almost consider it. You can almost consider the the uh, interaction of the operator as a process parameter, uh, and that you need some way to kind of record or detect what the what that's what that's doing to the machine. Uh, and so the this this could be if you if you changed it from say it's an operator or or something the machine's doing and said what if it's just temperature or something or, or the weather outside having an effect the in order to know if it's actually causing a problem or not you're going to have to measure it uh somehow and that could be logs on on what the um on what's going on with the machine uh it could be about uh taking uh, or even just um working with uh, the person at that machine and, and going through a day and just recording how, how, that, how that machine behavior um, forces the operator to make certain decisions and just tracking that and seeing if that correlates with the data later on. And so it, there's gonna have to be some type of measurement strategy. Um, if, and, and in some cases, it might be just easier just to log it um, or approach it where if you, if you have the luxury of having that data, uh, and present it to the operator and say, why do you think this is happening this way? Is there something that, that correlates that using them as a team member to help you uh, with that data and, and add some context? Thanks, Mike. Um, another one here uh, about the consideration of safety barriers in uh, class one division two zones. Um, do you have any uh, 
any information or a position on uh, on the necessity of, of safety barriers? Yeah, I mean, this, so this is going to be based on the different sites uh, and, the, and the different requirements per industry. Um, something like this, uh, I mean, you, you're going to have to probably, um, uh, from early on, for whoever's going to help you install the equipment, the sensors, maybe someone for maintenance or mill rights. Um, I mentioned getting IT involved very early in the project. For something like EX uh, or intrinsic, intrinsic safety questions, you might need someone from that that side of uh, the safety health and environmental or someone from the, or, or a team that works in this to be involved early on so that they understand um, what needs to be installed and then and that the project manager or the, or the one running the project can then be uh, familiar with how much that will add to the timing or how much that'll add for cost. Uh, and so knowing that ahead of time is gonna be very critical. Um, if, if you get halfway through this and find out that where you place the sensor is gonna be uh, class one division two or class one division one um, that's gonna be that's gonna be uh, possibly derailing and so getting getting the right people involved early on is going to be critical for that awesome thank you Mike um, well we want to thank everybody for being here we appreciate uh, you taking the time if you still have any unanswered questions please reach us out uh, to your local representative or send us an email to support.na at prooftechnic.com. Uh, furthermore, uh, join us next time um, in October, dates to be determined on vertical alignment and different measurement mode webinar. Uh, we will uh, we will give you guys a date closer, uh, closer at the end of September. We thank you all for being here and joining us today and we will see you next time. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Doug, as well. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.